Hi, I'm Mrs. Meyer. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Whitman Post Elementary School. And today I'm going to be sharing with you chapter two of Because of the Rabbit. Chapter two starts on page nine. A frightened rabbit can truly be scared to death. Pepe's stories always began with the words, it happened once. After that, each story took its own twists and turns, like a stream running this way or that way around the rocks, but it always ended with the words, so it was. When I was little, my grandparents were still alive. Owen and I used to visit Pepe and Meme every summer at their house, half a day away up north in Quebec, Canada. Dad would drop us off and pick us up a few weeks later. Even though Owen and I only ever lived with Pepe and Meme when we visited, Meme always greeted us with, you've come home, and she made it feel like home. I loved belonging there on the farm where dad grew up. In the early morning, Pepe would wake Owen and me, and we'd go out in the fields as the sun came up. By mid-morning, we'd have picked baskets full of vegetables or berries. Then we'd help Meme bake things to eat and sell. If I didn't know how to use the sifter or how small to cut the strawberries, Meme would say, watch. She'd move her hands slowly so I could see every movement her fingers made. At home, that would have felt like work, but it never did at Meme and Pape's. As we picked and baked, Pepe would tell us stories. He knew the name of every wild animal in the woods and skies around the farm and spoke to them like friends. He called the animals and birds by their names in French. Like Monsieur Casto, the beaver. Madame Tortue, the turtle. Monsieur Renard, the fox. Monsieur Corbeau, the crow. Madame Sittel, the nuthatch. And Monsieur Ibo, the owl. My favorite stories were about Monsieur Le Pay, a cottontail rabbit who was always getting into trouble. Sometimes he'd trick his way out. Other times, he learned a lesson. Those lessons never stuck too well, though. In the next story, he'd be back in trouble. None of the other animals held it against him. It was just who he was. If a rabbit popped up in the vegetable rows, Pepe would say, Bonjour, Monsieur Le Pay. I asked Pepe once why he called every rabbit Monsieur Le Pay, when there really could only be one. Every rabbit has some of Monsieur Le Pay's magic, he said. Rabbit magic is a powerful thing. As dad drove, I watched out the window and thought how tomorrow would be like the border crossing to Quebec. You drive through the checkpoint and there's a whole different country on the other side. School would change a lot of things. There might be a whole different me on the other side of tomorrow. I took a deep breath, the way Pepe always did, to pull a story inside me. It happened once. I said to dad beside me in the truck. Monsieur Le Pay was running away from the sneaky fox, Monsieur Renard. He jumped through a picket fence and got stuck. Dad smiled. He grew up with Pepe's stories too. Monsieur Le Pay wouldn't need a game warden to free him, would he? He'd trick Monsieur Casto into chewing the fence down with his sharp teeth. Or he'd tell Madame Sittel there were tasty bugs in the wooden pickets, I said. She and her nuthatch family would come and peck the fence apart, looking for them. Dad passed a Massachusetts car driving slowly in the front of us. <clears throat> Local people call the road we live on Moose Alley. It's a major road for us, connecting a small town with an even smaller one, right on the edge of the big woods stretching up to Canada. On the roadside are brushy areas and marshes where moose like to graze. As it gets close to dark or very early in the morning, we get extra cars with out-of-state license plate. That's the time the guidebooks tell you to go looking if you want to see Monsieur Original. I've seen moose at all times of the day, though. Moose don't read the guidebooks. Moose Alley doesn't even need a line painted down the middle because you can drive the whole 30 miles of it from town to town and only meet a handful of cars and a few logging trucks people from away call our part of Maine the sticks. Which is true, I guess. We have no shortage of sticks. <clears throat> Dad turned the truck into a small dirt road cutting through the woods. It was mostly a camp road, a road you could drive right past and not even see it, but the kind of road where things always seem to happen in Pepe's stories. I breathed in the Christmassy scent of pine and spruce through the open window. Okay, Em, Dad said, turning on his headlights to see better. Help me look for the house now. 
The lady said it was number 63. At first I thought he was kidding. There were hardly any houses, certainly not 63 of them, but there were a few numbers nailed to the trees and they seemed to jump 10 or more at a time. As we passed each house or camp, I looked for bikes and toys, clues that a kid lived there. There were lots of things I was hoping for tomorrow at school, but making new friends was number one. Maybe I'd even make a best friend. I really wanted to be half of an and like you see in books. Calvin and Hobbes, Frodo and Sam, Charlotte and Wilbur. Maybe we'd solve mysteries together or dress up as thing one and thing two for Halloween or be co-presidents of our own club. And we'd never miss each other because we'd see each other every day at school. I'd even made a list. Emma's best friend checklist. Likes me best. Likes the things I like. Shares secret jokes. Is always on my side. Let's me be me. Forgives me when I'm sorry. I just wrote down everything I missed with Owen. It's not that I didn't have other friends, kids from church and homeschool group, but when you live in a place where the houses are far apart, it takes some planning to see other kids. Owen had always been there. That's what I miss most, just him being there. And the worst part was that he liked school. Listening to all his stories, I couldn't help wondering if I were missing out on something big. This must be it, Dad said. Up ahead was a clearing with a small gray house and a white picket fence out front. No bikes, no toys, just an older woman outside holding a broom. As we got out of the truck, she called to us. I tried to poke the rabbit through, but he's wedged in there tight. Poke him through? I disliked her immediately. Don't touch him, ma'am. Dad shouted back pleasantly. He has to be nice to everyone unless they're breaking the law. I guess there wasn't an actual law about poking a rabbit with a broom. Dad grabbed his toolbox from the back of the truck and gave me the plastic bin and lid. As I got closer to the fence, I gasped. The rabbit certainly was stuck. His back feet and little puff tail dangled on one side, his head and front feet on the other. But what shocked me was how small he was, and he wasn't medium brown like a cottontail rabbit or rusty tan like a snowshoe hare in summer. He was a soft, honey gold color with a brown nose and front paws. He seemed to be frozen in fear, except for his little back rising and falling with each breath. Well, there's a surprise, Dad said. Do any of your neighbors have a pet rabbit? The woman shook her head. Not that I know of. Dad stroked his chin, thinking, look, I'm glad to free it, but as a game warden, I only deal with wildlife. You'll need to call your local animal control officer to come get this bunny. They handle pets. How long will that take? The woman asked. I'm supposed to be at a meeting. I can give you this bin to keep him in until animal control gets here, Dad said, but I can't. Let it hop back into the woods, the woman said. That's where rabbits belong. Not this rabbit, I said. He's not wild. She shot me an angry look. Well, he's not my rabbit. I turned to dad. You know he doesn't stand a chance in the woods, not with all those foxes and lynx and owls. Dad looked from the lady to the rabbit to me. Well, there's no need for him to suffer while we figure it out. He leaned down and ran his fingers along the rabbit's sides. His ribs are too round to go forward. So let's try easing him back the way he came. M. Take the bin and get behind him, but not too close to those hind legs. Even a little bunny's got a kick. The bin was ridiculously huge for such a tiny rabbit. It won't jump up and attack us, will it? The woman asked. I saw dad trying not to smile. I don't think so, but maybe you'd like to go in your house just in case, ma'am. Emma and I are trained rabbit wranglers, but I can't guarantee your safety. I bit the inside of my lips so I wouldn't giggle. The woman didn't look like she believed dad, but she took some steps backward anyway. The rabbit's hind legs were hanging down limp on my side of the fence, but his little tail twitched. My hands were aching to touch him and see if he was as soft as he looked, but I didn't want to scare him even more. Don't worry, I said, sitting on the ground behind him. We're here to help you. Between the pickets, I watched dad's hands on the rabbit's shoulders. Come on, don't fight it, he said, turning the rabbit gently. You're squeezed in here pretty good. It's going to take some work to get you out. 
The bunny's hind legs started kicking, wiggling him a little more onto my side. It's helping, I said. He's coming. Good. Set the bin on its side so he'll back into it, Dad said. Then as soon as he's inside, tip it upright and throw the lid on. As I was reaching for the bin, the rabbit gave a mighty kick. And suddenly, he was out. For one second, he looked towards the woods and saw it. That same flash of wild in his eyes, seeing freedom. Then he leaped, a funny little jump spin, landing on my leg. Maybe he was just so happy to be out of the fence that he couldn't help himself. But it gave me the chance to grab him. Got him! Great job, M. Dad turned to look behind him. Ma'am, let's call your local... But the lady was already in her car. Well, what do you expect me to do with him? Dad called. Her car windows were rolled up, though. She backed out of the driveway and took off down the road. Dad and I stood there listening to the sound of her tires crunching the rocks. I held the rabbit against me, his hind legs tucked into the crook of my elbow. He was scared to death. Still a stone except for his heart beating wildly under my hand and his whiskers tickling my neck with each panting breath. You can't leave him here, I told Dad firmly. That lady doesn't care what happens to him. The nearest animal shelter is in Rangeley, but I'm sure they're closed for right now, Dad sighed. I guess we could bring him home and then I could take him to the shelter in the morning. I tried to act calm. When really, I felt like dancing. I couldn't wait to show Owen. Can we go after school? We rescued him together and I want to be there. I suppose so, Dad said. But we'd better drive to the store and see if they sell rabbit food. And carrots! Walking back to the truck, the rabbit hid his face against my neck, his golden fur surrounded by my red hair. When an animal trusts you, it fills you up with a warm feeling. I rested my cheek against his ears. They were softer than I'd imagined. Are you sure you don't want to put him in the bin? Dad asked. He might have ticks or fleas. Nope, I'll carry him, and I'll check us both for bugs when we get home. Dad threw the bin in the back of the truck. Some days just don't end the way you think they will, he said. But I guess that's what makes life an adventure. As we drove back down the road through the woods, the rabbit stared at me. There was a soft look in his eyes. It could have been... Thank you, or wonder at the world flying past outside the window. Finding him felt like a sign. Pepe sending me some rabbit magic to say everything was going to be okay tomorrow. Maybe this really is Monsieur Le Pay, I joked to Dad, because he's already tricked us into rescuing him and feeding him. Dad laughed. Yes, he has. As he turned the truck back onto Moose Alley, I pulled in a deep breath. It happened once. Monsieur Le Pay was running away from Monsieur Renard and jumped through a fence and got stuck. So he pretended to be a helpless little pet bunny. He convinced a main game warden and his daughter to save him, bring him home, and give him a feast of carrots. Dad nodded. So it was. Looking at the rabbit in my arms, my heart hurt, but in a good way. I'd heard of love at first sight, but I'd always wondered if that was a real thing or just something people said. But that's how it felt. I loved him already. It's a powerful thing to rescue something. It changes both of you.